I'd like to uh, welcome you all to, uh, this is the first uh, director's lecture that's actually taking place in this new building. Uh, I'm actually delighted to see that it's uh, standing room only. Um, uh, David Bromwich is a Sterling Professor of English at Yale University, uh, where he was educated and he's taught there since 1998. Uh, he is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and he's the author of a really dazzling set of books on literary criticism, moral and political critique, uh, Hazlitt, The Mind of a Critic, A Choice of Inheritance, Politics by Other Means, Disowned Memory, Wordsworth Poetry in the, in the 1790s, Skeptical Music, and most recently two books, The Intellectual Life of Edmund Burke, From Sublime and Beautiful to American Independence, and uh, Moral Imagination. Now, he writes often for the New York Review of Books, the London Review of Books, and uh, before it died of Facebook poisoning, he was a frequent contributor to the New Republic. Uh, he regularly um, posts blogs of political commentary in the, on the Huffington Post. David Bromwich is, in my opinion, the preeminent moral and political essayist writing today. Now, in saying this, I'm not asking you to agree with his views, nor do I thereby express my own agreement. Um, I certainly acknowledge that there are other serious writers on politics and moral life. But it is Bromwich who has reanimated the political essay as an art form. And I do not mean, you know, just uh, by, by that, just art in the modern aesthetic sense, uh, an essay is a work of beauty, and I think his works are that, but also art in the ancient sense of techne. Uh, his political and moral essays are remarkable works of rhetoric, uh, written to persuade, to move the hearts and minds of his readers. He has an original voice, and it often goes against the cultural grain of the times. And it's clear that he takes himself to be addressing an audience that, at least at first, might well not agree with him. And one sees this clearly in his essays on Lincoln. And those essays do not just take up Lincoln's rhetoric as a matter for inquiry and examination. I think the essays inherit and express Lincoln's rhetorical style. Now, it's a feature of that style that Bromwich, the author, is remarkably present in his essays. I think we're you know, familiar with the contemporary cliche of authenticity with some vague notion of being true to oneself. But there's a deep notion um, that Kierkegaard worked out and Heidegger developed for people who, who shape themselves by taking responsibility for the concepts that they seek to instantiate. And I think Bromwich has taken responsibility for the essay form as a mode of moral and political persuasion. I think he's taken responsibility for the concepts of political argument and moral discourse by exemplifying them in his writing. Now, I don't want to anticipate Bromwich's argument, but I do want to give you an example of his rhetorical style and something that you might listen for this evening. And I picked a passage really pretty much at random. I think you can go to pretty much any, you know, any page at all. But here's a passage I um, just will, will read out to you. It's a discussion of the, um, the, the, the reverberations of the Kansas-Nebraska uh, legislation in 1854. Here's a, here's a passage from the book. Uh, <clears throat> the law raised a question for the accomplice as well as the master and the slave. Am I free in a country that uses the power of the state to compel me to assist in the capture of a human being who has risked his life for freedom? These things were deeply sifted deeply in those years. There has not been another time when so searching an inquest drew so many ingenuous minds to discuss the basis in law and morality of the life we Americans share. He's writing about Whitman and Lincoln together. He says, both Whitman and Lincoln were part of a radical current of opinion that started out in dissent. And in reading about their lives, you sometimes sense a peculiar self-confidence as of people who know they have company in their beliefs. You can feel it plainly when you read their writings if you listen to the pitch of their words. Though the uh, thunder comes when, it need, when they need it, they are, both, they are both of them by practice and almost by temperament soft-spoken writers. But they know that they are not alone. They know that someone is listening. And um, a text from Whitman, whoever degrades another degrades me, and from Lincoln, as I would not be a slave, so I would not be a master. This expresses my idea of democracy. Whatever differs from this to the extent of the difference is no democracy. The two statements have morally the same meaning. American slavery, they say, is a concomitant of American democracy and its degradation and betrayal. The work of democracy in these years will be to resist that betrayal and save the constitutional system from destruction. 
In this contest, the enemy is a selfishness so perfect that it would preserve a freedom to treat other persons as property. This then is the cause, but the motive of resistance is deeper. It comes from an idea of the self that, like the sense of property cherished by slave power, could have arisen only in a democracy." Unquote. So Bromwich says, there has not been another time when so searching an inquest drew so many ingenuous minds. In a simple sentence, he assumes a vision of the entire sweep of American political thinking. We are in the presence of an author with a confident vision of the whole. He says that Whitman and Lincoln have a peculiar self-confidence. Quote, they know they are not alone. They know someone is listening. And he says you can feel it plainly when you read their writing if you listen to the pitch of their words. In effect, Bromwich invites the reader to return to Lincoln's words in a fresh way, to listen to their pitch. And in listening to the pitch, we can come to grasp the author afresh. Bromwich finds a way to express Lincoln's understanding that slavery is a concomitant of American democracy. The two, in an uncanny sense, have been bound together, but with slavery being democracy's degradation and betrayal. And then comes a sentence, I think, of real artistry. In this contest, the enemy is a selfishness so perfect that it would preserve the freedom to treat other persons as property. Now, I want to confess an almost guilty pleasure in watching Bromwich deal with those with whom he disagrees. I'll give you an example. Bromwich takes up David Herbert Donald's interpretation of Lincoln's second inaugural address, and that's one that sees Lincoln as trying to shift the blame for the violence of the war uh, from himself onto God. And Bromwich says in response, though Donald's biography has every strength compatible with deep learning, sound judgment, and a gracious narrative, uncomplicated by much power of admiration, the result is to misread and really misunderstand the second inaugural address." Unquote. Well, so much for having every strength compatible with deep learning, sound judgment, and a gracious narrative, if it is also uncomplicated by the power of admiration. And I think this is Bromwich's strength, to be able to, be able to admire a supremely complex figure, Lincoln, who deserved to be admired. Now, in the simplest of sentences, Bromwich says, quote, hatred of violence and love of liberty are the clues to Lincoln's political character, unquote. Now, I'm struck by the boldness and simplicity of the claim. It is an interpretation in the deepest sense, a claim that all the complexity, all the violence can be understood in terms of these two principles. Now, I don't know enough myself to know whether this claim is true, but I am stunned by its organizing power. Now, tomorrow is the anniversary of Abraham Lincoln's birth, and I cannot think of a better way for us to honor the memory of this remarkable person than by having David Bromwich speak to us this evening on the subject of Lincoln as realist and revolution. revolutionist. Thank you very much. Thank you for those, those words of more than friendship. Um, I, I like being called Bromwich by somebody who used, usually calls me David. Um, and it's a relief to hear I'm present in my work um, since I just wrote something in the form of a diary for a publication and was told by one of the editors that you have to use the word I a bit more often if we're going to publish this a diary. <laughs> so. Um, <clears throat> The uh, title of this lecture is Lincoln uh, as Realist and Revolutionist, uh, a title that I think explains itself, but uh, I'm using realist in the common sense uh, adaptation of that word, which is to say um, people who look at the world straight and aren't taken in by things and are willing to uh, step this way and that, willing to compromise, and revolutionist in appreciation of the fact that uh, the Civil War has sometimes been called the Second American Revolution, and I think Lincoln appreciated that possibility and uh, without quite embracing his part in it, accepted uh, that he would be playing a part in it. <clears throat> In an oration uh, on the career and proper fame of Lincoln, delivered on April 14, 1876, at the unveiling of the Freedmen's Monument in Washington, D.C., Frederick Douglass offered this summing up, <clears throat> quoting Douglass. His great mission was to accomplish two things. First, 
to save his country from dismemberment and ruin, and second, to free his country from the great crime of slavery. To do one or the other or both, he must have the earnest sympathy and the powerful cooperation of his loyal fellow countrymen. Viewed from the genuine abolition ground, Mr. Lincoln seemed tardy, cold, dull, and indifferent. But measuring him by the sentiment of his country, a sentiment he was bound as a statesman to consult, he was swift, zealous, radical, and determined. Among all the reports uh, I know of from contemporary witnesses, these words by Douglas offer, I think, the most accurate judgment of Lincoln's motives and his predicament. And in this hour, I'll speak about uh, the path of evidence from September uh, 1854 to January 1863 that supports Frederick Douglass's view. The first of those dates marks the delivery of Lincoln's speech on the Kansas-Nebraska Act in Peoria, when, as he said, the repeal of the Missouri Compromise aroused him and drew him from a prosperous legal practice back into politics. The second date uh, signifies the coming into effect of the Emancipation Proclamation. The sheer quantity of evidence illustrating the steadiness of Lincoln's commitment against slavery is weightier than I think is now commonly understood and more conclusive than is generally conceded in recent scholarship on emancipation and on the Civil War. But it's not only quantity that matters. We know a good deal about Lincoln's habits of thought as well as about his calculations from reports by people who had a clear enough view to be relied on. There's a good deal, too, that we can infer from circumstantial evidence, tactical evasions, or strategic silences, and also avowals that initially may sound ambiguous but come into sharper focus the better you know the mind of Lincoln. Why draw attention to this evidence today? None of it is new. But I think there has been a slide in the popular idea of Lincoln and in scholarly writings as well toward regarding him as a mostly moderate and prudential leader who used expedient methods in his attempt to hold the North and South together. In the middle of the war and under exigent presser, pressure, so it's argued in this picture of Lincoln, he abolished slavery uh, in order to hold the Union together. There remain important dissenters from this view, including the most widely respected historian of the Civil War, James M. McPherson, and among Lincoln's recent biographers, uh, Eric Foner uh, and uh, Albert Guelzo, to, in some measure. But clever people who pride themselves on their own realism, or a word that's really the same thing in politics, their pragmatism, warmed the idea of Lincoln as a moderate, a realist, an effective manager of cross-currents in politics who entered the Civil War reluctantly, arrived at emancipation late, and held a limited hope for its efficacy as a device to end the war. I think you'll recognize that picture. It comes out in lots of speeches, uh, informal talks, uh, and uh, writings about Lincoln over the past uh, three or four decades. The most considerable support for this interpretation has come from the writings of David Herbert Donald, a Whig in his earlier years, as uh, John, uh, as uh, Donald reminds us. Uh, Lincoln, he thinks, remained a Whig at heart long after the dissolution of his party in 1856-57. A Whig in those years was bound by a concern with industrial advance and internal improvements, uh, a preference not necessarily hostile to slavery in principle, and bound by a commitment to the preservation of the Union, in comparison to which the cause of abolition of slavery could often seem a ponderous abstraction. This interpretation was carried over by Donald from a book of essays, Lincoln Reconsidered, uh, 1956, to his full-length biography, uh, Lincoln, 1995. It's agreed among historians and commentators of this school that Lincoln was by no means an idealist and that he rightly kept his distance from abolitionists. 
The moderate interpreters have two favorite texts, which I'll come back to, but I may as well quote them now. First is the letter of August, uh, August 22nd, 1862, to Horace Greeley, in which, in answer to some pointed inter interrogatories, Lincoln said, quote, My paramount object in this struggle is to save the Union and is not either to save or to destroy slavery. If I could save the Union without freeing any slave, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing all the slaves, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing some and leaving others alone, I would also do that. On the face of it, those sentences seem to defend alike the abolition and the perpetuation of slavery as alternative, purely instrumental courses of action to achieve a non-moral end. If you think a nation and its perpetuation uh, as such is non-moral, and I do think that. The other leading exhibit for the moderate school, uh, Lincoln's uh, letter of uh, April 1864 to Albert Hodges, seems to show him resigned to passive cooperation with impersonal forces. Quote, I claim not to have controlled events, but confess plainly that events have controlled me. Now, the sentences uh, I've just quoted from those letters uh, meant just what they seem to say. There would be not much more comment worth my while on Lincoln as emancipator uh, and Lincoln as radical. But I'll be arguing, on the contrary, that from 1854 on, he saw distinctly that the abridgment of general freedom required by the slave system the freedom, that is, of white as well as black laborers, was an impediment to the realization of the rights promised by the Declaration of Independence. He also saw that the unyielding and ferocious temper of the slaveholding interest might require a war in order to achieve abolition, and in the mid-1850s, he resolved to test the alternative of accommodation or war by contributing to shape a Republican platform centered on the, on the principle of no extension of slavery. I should say, no extension of slavery sounds like the, pl the plank of a party uh, platform rather than a moral principle. It only, be it only becomes, it, it deserves the name of principle somewhat more if you recognize that Lincoln, in the same formulation, uh, had said that he wanted to put the uh, slavery uh, in such a uh, situation that the public mind would rest that it was in the course of, in the belief that it was in the course of ultimate extinction. So if you're seeking not to extend slavery with the aim of ultimately extinguishing it, concern with right and wrong is uh, in view. He employed the medium of a party and a party platform then, but he knew that a second American revolution might be necessary to vindicate the premises of the first. <clears throat> the reputation of the early Lincoln as, above all, a prudent politician can be traced to real emphases in some of his earliest speeches. His 1842 address to the Temperance Society of Springfield, for example, had praised the utility of, of a temperate approach to persuasion by teetotalers like him who aimed to convert ordinary drinkers to their cause. This is Lincoln in 1842, uh, one, by ordinary drinkers as opposed to drunkards who, who, are, who are either hopeless or want a religious conversion. Uh, when the conduct of men is designed to be influenced, the conduct of men, persuasion, kind, unassuming persuasion should ever be adopted. It is an old and a true maxim that a drop of honey catches more flies than a gallon of gall. So with men. If you would win a man to your cause, first convince him that you are his sincere friend. A good rule for uh, political persuasion of most kinds, but not all kinds. One finds a similar ameliorative impulse uh, guiding Lincoln's address of 1838, much more famous speech on the perpetuation of American political institutions. 
the habit of abiding by the law, the habit merely, and the conscious commitment to maintain it emerges there as the central requirement for the avoidance of mob rule, which could usher in a national demagogue. Lincoln, in that early address, of course, does acknowledge that bad laws exist and the means for changing them must always be available in a government worthy of our respect. But so long as a bad law is in force, he says, no citizen ought to indulge in a single deviation from it. This will be the basis of what Lincoln calls our political religion, his phrase. Obedience to existing laws becomes the most proper expression of piety toward the founding fathers. And I'll quote from the Lyceum Address of 1838 here. Let every American, every lover of liberty, every well-wisher to his posterity swear by the blood of the revolution, never to violate in the least particular the laws of the country, and never to tolerate their violation by others. As the Patriots of 76 did, to, to the support of the Declaration of Independence, so to the support of the Constitution and laws, let every American pledge his life, his property, and his sacred honor. Let every man remember that to violate the laws, to trample on the blood of his father, and to tear the character of his own and his children's liberty. Let reverence for the laws, reverence for the laws, not just obedience, be breathed by every American mother to the lisping babe that prattles on her lap. I think I'll stop there. This is young Lincoln. <clears throat> A concern to show respect for law-abiding natures, for law-abiding people, uh, all of them, so long as they don't ex uh, seek this extension of slavery, appears again in a passage that uh, reverses or seems to reverse the forward motion of argument in Lincoln's speech on the Kansas-Nebraska Act, September uh, 1854. The people of the South, he says there, quote, this is in this concessive mode that I think the moderates, uh, the moderate interpreters of Lincoln hang everything on. The people of the South are just what we would be in their situation. If slavery did not now exist amongst them, they would not introduce it. If it did now exist amongst us, we should not instantly give it up. This I believe of the masses, North and South. Doubtless there are individuals on both sides who would not hold slaves under any circumstances and others who would gladly introduce slavery anew if it were out of existence. We know that some Southern men do free their slaves, go North and become tip-top abolitionists, while some Northern ones go South and become most cruel slave masters. There is, I think, something emollient in this adoption of a stance of sociological, as it were, neutrality on the question of moral principle, which of all others should rule out even-handedness. But Lincoln's apparent equivocation here depends on his belief that vicious habits, innate in the small proportion of human beings who are outlaws in spirit, can be gradually purged in the rest if only uh, they are given a drop of honey rather than a gallon of gall. But then rather surprisingly in the Kansas-Nebraska speech, Lincoln goes even a step further in concession. Quote, much as I hate slavery, I would, consent, I would consent to the extension of it rather than see the union dissolved, just as I would consent to any great evil in order to avoid a greater one. There speaks the Lincoln prized by the moderates, the realists, the pragmatists. But the truth is he seldom spoke like that. The promise offered in that egregious sentence is one he never kept. And his stature would have uh, hardly have risen uh, higher than that of Stephen Douglas if he had turned such passing moments of concession into steady policy. Now, the practical directives that Nick Lincoln offers in the Kansas-Nebraska speech of 54 pick up some of the same conciliatory shading, and to that extent, they, they part from the moral analysis of slavery uh, that had aroused him uh, and drawn him back into politics. In a trimming passage near the end of the same speech, Lincoln seems bent on fashioning a national consensus out of materials he has already shown to be unharmonizing. Quote, Stand with the abolitionist in, re in restoring the Missouri Compromise, which drew at, you know, 3630, the line above which there should be no slavery ever. And stand against him, against the abolitionist, when he attempts to repeal the Fugitive Slave Law. 
In the latter case, you stand with the Southern disunionist. What of that? You are still right. In both cases, you are right. In both cases, you oppose the dangerous extremes. In both, you stand on middle ground and hold the ship level and steady. In both, you are national and nothing less than national. This is good old Whig ground. And the Whig party still existed in, in uh, 1854, 1856 was the last election in which they ran a candidate for president. With this return uh, to a good old Whig ground, we seemed to see confirmed the image of Lincoln the moderate the politician of nothing less than national interest. The Kansas-Nebraska speech as a whole is argued in convincing detail with tight connections among its complex parts and a powerful insight in forming its excursus on self-government. But Lincoln's speech on the Mexican War six years earlier had been far less tactical when it exposed to a candid public the full scope of the dangers he believed that war had opened. I don't see, on the other hand, how the Kansas-Nebraska speech can withstand the reproach of Thoreau's warning in civil disobedience against the false allure of moderation. And this is Thoreau from that essay, 1848. If the injustice, any injustice we have in view, if the injustice is part of the necessary friction of the machine of government, let it go, let it go. Perchance it will wear smooth. Certainly the machine will wear out. This reminds one of the comment by Thoreau on the American founders, very lacking in reverence he was when he says that compared to John Brown, uh, Washington, Franklin, and the rest of them seem like old clocks that have run down. Um, the friction of the machine of government. Anyway, let it go, let it go. Perchance it will wear smooth, certainly the machine will wear out. If the injustice has a spring or a pulley or a rope or a crank exclusively for itself, then perhaps you may consider whether the remedy will not be worse than the evil, as Lincoln has said in the passage I just quoted on, from Kansas, Nebraska. But if it is of such a nature that it requires you to be the agent of injustice to another, then I say, break the law. Let your life be a counter friction to stop the machine. And uh, he's writing in particular about the fugitive slave law, Lincoln's subject in the passage I just read his equivocation about. When Lincoln delivered the Kansas-Nebraska speech, he was emerging from six years of legal practice during which he could well have supposed the necessary friction of the machine of government was a thing outside his reach. Maybe it had a secret string or pulley which would remedy the injustice without any greater evil, without the greater evil, if it is a greater evil, of war. But as he went forward to become politically engaged once more as a state leader in the Republican Party, a candidate for the Senate in 1858, a candidate for president in 1860, and the national leader in a civil war precipitated by the slavery question, he came to see his own life as a counter friction to stop the machine. Lincoln's speech on the Dred Scott decision of June uh, 1857 is a turning point. It's his most angry speech, and yet one may notice on a second or third reading, the anger here is only partly on behalf of slaves who are forcibly returned to slavery. What troubled Lincoln as much was the distortion of constitutional law and history that showed so conspicuously in the uh, opinion written by Chief Justice Taney. Taney there declared uh, it had been the intention of the American founders to perpetuate the institution of slavery and defend the right of slaveholders to claim and reclaim their property and persons and prevent Negroes from ever entering into the rights of U.S. citizenship. The opinion aimed, in short, to sever any possible connection between the survival of American democracy and the hope of liberty for, as Lincoln puts it in this speech, all people of all colors everywhere. In view of the intended scope of this judicial opinion, as Lincoln saw it, Stephen Douglas's endorsement of the Dred Scott decision as a help in resolving the sectional conflict, even at the cost of sanctifying slavery as a system improve, uh, approved of by the founders, this amounted to a second act of opportunism by Douglas, a fitting sequel to his push for the repeal of the Missouri Compromise. I think that's how one has to see Lincoln's uh, 
really dogged pursuit of Douglas up and down the state of Illinois in those years, 1854 to 1858. It was quite something. I mean, not that one should have a moment's sympathy for Douglas, but if one didn't admire Lincoln so much, actually one might. Here was a very capable speaker and uh, somebody who thought compromise after compromise might hold the union together, being pursued um, by somebody outside politics for many years who was now coming back in, a very tall and strange man who gives a speech in the town you've just left right after you've left it, and sometimes a speech that you fear will be so effective that you uh, agree to speak after him. Um, the Kansas-Nebraska event is Douglas speaking for three hours, Lincoln for another three, and then Douglas for an hour and a half after Lincoln. And it's a very funny little prefatory statement Lincoln makes there where he advises the audience to uh, go have their dinner because he intends to speak as long as Douglas. And he knows that this is a good tactic because they wouldn't want to hear him unless they could hear Douglas skin him afterwards. So there's, there's a lot of feeling of sport about this, but of course it's about the gravest of of, uh, of matters. Um, if Lincoln was stirred to denunciation in 1857, and in many of the speeches that followed on the way to his final statement on the Republican platform resisting the extension of slavery at Cooper Union, February 1860, still the indications of some readiness for compromise occur at two significant later moments, and I want to note these. In the closing paragraph of the first inaugural, Lincoln would address the people of the South beseechingly, we are not enemies, but friends. Though passion may have strained, it must not break our bonds of affection. And again, in his address to a committee of colored men on August 14th, 1862, and he allowed this to be transcribed and published because he wanted it uh, in the public view for some reason. When he'd already, this is August 1862, preliminary emancipation is September 1862, he's already pretty well decided on issuing that preliminary announcement. Nevertheless, Lincoln took extraordinary pains to guard his flank. He conveyed a reproach to the invited black delegation by saying the war would never have happened but for the presence of, pre presence of Negroes in the United States. And he disclaimed any hope that white and black people could live together uh, in a condition approaching that of social equals. Here's a moment when any admirer of Lincoln must feel admiration tipping back into something more qualified, because he here almost retracts everything he has previously said about the monstrous injustice of slavery. It's as if the slaves themselves were to blame for it in some degree, and the peace of the Union the unwitting victim of their missteps how to read it as an interlude of sickly prudence or maybe of panic in both uh, readings very uncharacteristic of Lincoln though not unknown to persons on the verge of declaring a momentous commitment they feel they might somehow have escaped from. Frederick Douglass in the address I quoted at the start singled out for a rebuke this moment of backsliding. The faith of black people in the good intentions of Lincoln, he said, was strained and taxed to the uttermost when he strangely told us that we were the cause of the war. And that admonishment uh, to his black visitors in the White House was delivered by Lincoln as part of a plea for emigration and colonization as the best possible result of the war for black Americans. These were things he hadn't said before and didn't say after, but he does say in mid-August 1862. He had never made that suggestion so prominently uh, to repeat uh, until this moment. Go back, though, and try to make out uh, that Lincoln was then a prudential moderate, preference for colonization being a sort of test of that political character in the 1850s and early 60s. And you find that even in Kansas, Nebraska, 1854, there's a strident overtone against slavery that's by no means congenial to a policy avoiding conflict. Lincoln described in that speech what he called the declared indifference, but the covert and real zeal for the spread of slavery, which led to the opening of those territories alike to freemen and slaveholder. And he laid down as a moral law that allowed no exceptions. Quote, <clears throat> this is Lincoln in that speech, slavery is founded in the selfishness of man's nature. Opposition to it 
is his love of justice. These principles are in, inter are in eternal antagonism and when brought into collision as slavery extension brings them, not the presence of black people, but slavery extension there brings them into collision, shocks and throws and convulsions must ceaselessly follow. A year after he uttered those words, we find him in 1855 writing a private letter to Joshua Speed, which is the most revealing such document we have. Speed and Lincoln were close friends going back to their 20s and had room together in an apartment above Speed's dry goods store. In 1855, Joshua Speed was the son of a slaveholding family in Kentucky, and though never an advocate of slave expansion, he had no intention of freeing his own slaves and made clear his objection to Lincoln's radicalism in this matter. Lincoln's reply to his old friend gives us one of his few unguarded statements on slavery. His career affords no other uh, I think no other such occasion to look at for us when he is impelled to go to this length. <clears throat> and he did it because he was addressing a trusted friend about a difference between them that cut deep. This is Lincoln to Speed. And uh, how old are they now? Uh, 55. They're, they're both in their early 40s, mid-40s. In 1841, <clears throat> you and I had together a tedious low-water trip on a steamboat from Louisville to St. Louis. You may remember, as I well do, that from Louisville to the mouth of the Ohio, there were on board 10 or a dozen slaves shackled together with irons. That sight was a continual torment to me and I see something like it every time I touch the Ohio or any other slave border. It is hardly fair for you to assume that I have no interest in a thing which has and continually exercises the power of making me miserable. You ought rather to appreciate how much the great body of the Northern people do crucify their feelings in order to maintain their loyalty to the Constitution of the Union. I do oppose the extension of slavery because my judgment and feelings so prompt me, and I am under no obligation to the contrary. If for you, excuse me, if for this you and I must differ, differ we must. This letter uh, goes on to speak of the illegitimacy of political forces that combined to repeal the Missouri Compromise uh, as, part, as sort of an annex in the uh, Kansas-Nebraska Act. Uh, and uh, uh, the... Uh, perception that that bit of the act was included late and was so crucial, I think uh, could have seemed to Lincoln already in, in, at the time he writes this letter to Speed, 1855, part of a national effort to re-legitimate slavery itself. So the letter goes on, and I'll quote more of it. In your assumption that there may be a fair decision of the slavery question in Kansas, I plainly see you and I would differ about the Nebraska law. I look upon that enactment not as a law, but as violence from the beginning. It was conceived in violence, passed in violence, is maintained in violence, and is being executed in violence. I say it was conceived in violence because the destruction of the Missouri Compromise under the circumstances was nothing less than violence. It was passed in violence because it could not have passed at all but for the votes of many members in violent disregard of the known will of their constituents. It is maintained in violence because the elections since clearly demanding, demand its repeal and this demand is openly disregarded. So the new preponderance which Lincoln speaks of here, a violent means for attaining the national extension of slavery that he would have had in mind again in the second inaugural, um, has already lodged itself with him in 1855 to remind you of the, the relevant phrase for this perception in the, in the second inaugural, quote, both parties deprecated war. And that's deprecated in the strong, correct sense of the word, prayed against. Um, didn't want war, but one of them would make war rather than let the nation survive, and the other would accept war rather than let it perish. The, violent, the violence then that Lincoln deprecated uh, in his letter to Speed was violence preparatory to war and distinguishable from war only in degree. Of course, defenders of the slaveholding interest could reply this was a necessary violence committed in the cause of enforcing laws such as the Fugitive Slave Law, and hadn't Lincoln himself affirmed that bad laws must be obeyed. The same people 
could go on to observe that all resistance to slavery is violence against the legal property rights of slaveholders. The counterargument available to someone of Lincoln's views was that the original violence came not from resistance to slavery, but from slavery itself. He never says it, but he must have thought it. This was something that one can say on the strength of his letter to Speed. He must indeed have believed since the early 1840s, but to repeat, he never said it until the second inaugural. <clears throat> Turn once more now to the Dred Scott decision informed by this understanding of Lincoln's general principle and his tacit, privately avowed judgment on slavery. And you see how the sweep of Tawney's opinion could have hardened his resolve not to wait for another retrograde step towards slavery. No more waiting, no more compromise. These, as I hear it, make the double emphasis of Lincoln's house-divided speech of June 16th, 1858, his most important speech by far. Among the peculiar features of the utterance are its blend of first-person asseveration and impersonal analysis. You'll hear that in the march of propositional sentences, a paragraph to each sentence with which he throws down his opening challenge. The appearance of the word I and the complete absence of any sense of agency from I to the actions. It's as if the actions are part of physics, not politics. If we could first know where we are and whither we are tending, we could then better know what to do and how to do it. We are now far into the fifth year since a policy was initiated with the avowed object and confident promise of putting an end to slavery agitation. In my, excuse me, under the operation of that policy, that agitation has not only not ceased, but has constantly augmented. In my opinion, it will not cease until a crisis shall have been reached and passed. A house divided against itself cannot stand. I believe this government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free. I do not expect the union to be dissolved. I do not expect the house to fall, but I do expect it will cease to be divided. It will become all one thing or all the other. Either the opponents of slavery will arrest the further spread of it and place it where the public mind shall rest in the belief that it is in the course of ultimate extinction, or its advocates will push it forward till it shall become alike lawful in all the states, old as well as new, north as well as south. Have we no tendency to the latter condition, all slave? As he spoke those words, Lincoln uh, recognized, I think, that a civil war fought on the issue of slavery had become a distinct possibility. And he presses his listeners to recognize with him that there is one thing that could happen to the Union that would be even worse than war. The slaveholding South heard in these words an incendiary provocation. Did they hear wrong? Or is it modern historians who are more obtuse when they see the House Divided speech uh, at the Republican Party convention in Springfield, 1858, as a mere convention speech intended to rouse the party to obey the imperative of unity? Stephen Douglas held the dire view of what Lincoln was up to, and throughout his early debates, to the best of his ability, he made their contest a referendum on the peril of Lincoln's radicalism with the speech itself the prime exhibit. In fact, if you had to make a descriptive subtitle for those early debates, you could hardly do better than to call them House Divided Speech Under Siege. All Lincoln's efforts of rebuttal go towards showing his argument is more carefully worked out and supported by sounder evidence than Douglas will acknowledge. The largest provocation of this speech and the point Douglas worked hardest to get Lincoln to retract was the charge against Douglas himself that, in preparing the public mind for the Dred Scott decision and then endorsing the decision, he had been a participant in a conspiracy to nationalize slavery. Lincoln thought he could perceive a coherent design in, first, the promise by the outgoing president, Franklin Pierce, that a decision was pending from the Supreme Court which would be a settler of sectional troubles. Second, the statement by the incoming president, James Buchanan, that all Americans ought to respect and abide by the authority of that decision, because it's law, whatever it turned out to be. Third, the theoretical comprehensiveness and practical scope of Tawney's strange reading of slavery as a permanent commitment of the founders. And fourth, Lincoln's endorsement, of, excuse me, Douglas's endorsement of the decision once made. 
Here's the way Lincoln narrates the connection among these events, which might look discreet from each other to an innocent eye. Quote, from the middle of the House Divided Speech. Why was the amendment expressly declaring the right of the people to exclude slavery from territories? Why was that amendment voted down? Plainly enough, now, the adoption of it would have spoiled the niche for the Dred Scott decision. Why was the court decision held up? Why even a senator's individual opinion withheld till after the presidential election? Plainly enough, now, the speaking out then would have damaged the perfectly free argument upon which the election was to be carried. Why the outgoing president's felicitation on the endorsement? Why the delay of uh, argument? Why the incoming president's advance exhortation in favor of the decision? These things look like the cautious padding and petting of a spirited horse preparatory to mounting him when it is dreaded that he may give the rider a fall. And why the hasty endorsements of the decision by the president and others? We cannot absolutely know that all these exact adaptations are the result of pre-concert. And here comes a sentence, 16 lines long, in which you will not for a moment be in doubt of the sense of it, the clarity, and where it's going. This is Lincoln. But when we see a lot of framed timbers, different portions of which we know have been gotten out at different times and places by different workmen, Stephen, Franklin, Roger, and James, for instance, and when we see these timbers joined together and see they exactly make the frame of a house or a mill, all the tenons and mortises exactly fitting, and all the lengths and proportions of the different pieces exactly adapted to their respective places, and not a piece too many or too few, not omitting even scaffolding. Or if a single piece be lacking, we can see the place in the frame exactly fitted and prepared to yet bring such a piece in. In such a case, we find it impossible <clears throat> not to believe that Stephen and Franklin and Roger and James all understood one another from the beginning and all worked upon a common plan or draft drawn up before the first lick was struck. This, what to call it, narrative montage of circumstantial evidence and the inference Lincoln draws about the lined motives, the cooperative purpose of the four principles, seems to me one of the most forcible uh, pieces of persuasion in his writings. Now, the almost reflexive reaction of a well-trained academic today uh, is, I think, to reject any assumption of conspiracy as a deliberate exaggeration, an aberrant appeal by a sane politician to cranks and hotheads in the audience. But in America, we have become strangely innocent about the meaning of conspiracy. Lincoln isn't using the idea here and repeating it in the debates with Douglas with a view to incriminate the man he accuses. A political collaboration is what he's talking about, not something that leads to legal action. And as Lincoln sees it, it rightly uh, warrants the name of conspiracy when powerful actors work on tacit motives which they can discern in one another while operating in public from unavowed motives excuse me, are working in public from avowed motives of a very different character. In the setting of 1858, wrote Don Fehrenbacher in his discussion of the speech in Prelude to Greatness, the charge of a conspiracy to nationalize slavery carried conviction. And this is Fehrenbacher. I'm quoting now. Lincoln, to be sure, was exercising the politician's privilege of overstating his case. In later speeches, he admitted that the existence of a plot could only be inferred, and he conceded that Douglas might have been playing the role of dupe instead of conspiracy. It's a wonderful moment of, um, what to say, mock concession in, the, I forget if it's the first or the second debate, where he says, now that Douglas has admitted that he uh, uh, didn't know of anything like an agreement between him and Pierce and Buchanan and so on, you have, he says to the audience, the choice of just regarding him as a simpleton. Um, he, ne he needn't be a conspirator. <clears throat> but the effects, this is Fehrenbacher again, the effects were what mattered, he argued, not the motives. A trend toward the nationalization of slavery had become manifest. It was more than mere accident. And the advocates of popular sovereignty, whether intentionally or not, were contributing to it. Lincoln's deep fear was the opening of a legal path for the nationalization of slavery, uh, and that this would lead, if it happened, to a debasement of manners and corruption of the morale of the American people. 
Nine months after the House divided speech, he said as much in a speech in Chicago, March 1st, 1859. The Republican principle, he there identifies simply with, quote, the profound central truth that slavery is wrong and ought to be dealt with as a wrong. This understanding, he adds, quote, cannot at all advance upon Judge Douglas's ground that there's a portion of the country in which slavery must always exist, that he does not care whether it's voted up or down, as it's simply a question of dollars and cents. Accordingly, when faced by any new proposed compromise, quote, the proposition now in our minds that this thing is wrong, being once driven out and surrendered, then, says Lincoln, the institution of slavery necessarily becomes natural, uh, national. And I think that was the dark um, premonition that he felt in these years of the late 1850s. Suppressed it a lot um, and put it into very restrained and at the same time um, focused and vigorous form in the, in the Cooper Union speech, which is in some ways a very politic speech and in other ways a radical speech. But I think that's the emphasis. The fear of the nationalization and the real extension of slavery is there. The might of disproportionate wealth derived from property and persons, will drive out the right of self-government, which Lincoln had explained in 1854 as the sheet anchor of American republicanism, the conviction that no man has the right to govern another without his consent, and that the Negro being a man and all men being created equal, the Negro has a right to govern himself, and the white man no right by virtue of race or privilege to govern anyone other than himself. War thus follows from an accurate reading of the House Divided Speech. And the proclamation of emancipation uh, is a necessary inference from the causes of the war interpreted in that speech. Well, but uh, it might be asked, if the South read Lincoln right, did a great many in the North perhaps read him wrong when they fought a battle to preserve the Union, so they believed, which was really a battle to eradicate slavery? I don't think so. Lincoln invited all Republicans and their political allies to treat slaveholding as an instance of a broader political evil which they had practice in repudiating, namely despotism. His treatment of slavery before 1863 emerges in this light, not as a tactical evasion of a comprehensive design, rather slavery was the present illustration of an immemorial wrong. The right course of action toward the evil is self-evident, and the call for patience and the assurance of ultimate extinction of the wrong, 1854, had given way by 1858 to the call for readiness in the face of an imminent threat. His rallying cry against despotism comes out strongest between the first and second debates with Douglas in a speech given in Edwardsville, September 11, 1858. Lincoln speaks here in an arresting phrase about the logic of history. And here is a bit, a bit from the end of that. I think it's the last paragraph of that speech. Now, when you've succeeded in dehumanizing the Negro, when you have put him down and made it forever impossible for him to be but as the beasts of the field, when you've extinguished his soul and placed him where the ray of hope is blown out in darkness like that which broods over the spirits of the damned, are you quite sure the demon which you have roused will not turn and rend you? What constitutes the bulwark of our own liberty and independence? It is not our frowning battlements, our bristling sea coasts, the guns of our war steamers, or the strength of our gallant disciplined army. They are not our reliance against the resumption of tyranny in the fair land. Our reliance is in the love of liberty which God has planted in our bosoms. The mention of the means of enslavement as a force for de humanization seems to me remarkable. An early use of the word and a use of it that surely indicates Lincoln's belief in a non-racial standard of human dignity. But the entire passage at the end of the Edwardsville speech also confirms a general argument uh, against despotism by its echo of Edmund Burke's appeal to the true spirit of the British Constitution in his 1775 speech on conciliation with the colonies. Uh, Remember Lincoln talking about what constitutes the bulwark of our liberty. It's not your frowning battlements, our bristling sea coasts, war of the steamers. These are not our reliance. Our reliance is the love of liberty. And Burke has said, um, you know, do not uh, think that they can get freedom from anyone but you to the American. Slavery is a weed they can have anywhere. Um, uh, deny them this participation of freedom and you break the soul bond 
which made and must preserve the unity of the empire. Do not entertain so weak an imagination as that your registers or your bonds, your frowning battlements, your affidavits or your sufferances, your, your sea coasts, your cockets and your clearances are what form the great securities of the commerce. Do not dream that your letters of office, your instructions, your suspending clauses are the things that hold together the great contexture of the mysterious whole. These things do not make your government dead instruments, passive tools as they are. It is the spirit of the English communion of liberty that gives all their life and efficacy to them. This was still a pattern of thought at the front of Lincoln's mind when he wrote the deeply tactical letter I started with uh, to Horace Greeley on August 22nd, 1862. Greeley, in an editorial in the New York Tribune, had accused Lincoln of employing too light a hand against slavery and so betraying the cause of union properly understood. And so to repeat, the key sentence of Lincoln's reply became this, quote, if I could save the union without freeing any slaves, I would do it. If I could save by freeing all the slaves, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing some and leaving others alone, I would also do that. Differently attuned ears could interpret these words in different ways. As Eric Foner has pointed out, a letter from Wendell Phillips to a fellow abolitionist, the managing editor of the New York Tribune, Sidney Howard Gay, referred to Lincoln's formulation, apparently of moral indifference, as, and this is Wendell Phillips, about those words you just heard from Lincoln, release none, some, all, the most disgraceful document that ever came from the head of a free people. But Gay, the recipient of this letter from Phillips, took the same words to be a coded hint that complete destruction of the slave system was now for the first time in contemplation. Would Lincoln have even announced so drastic a possibility as freeing all the slaves unless he meant to carry it out? A frank explanation of the connection between emancipation and entry into full rights of citizenship for the first time for all Americans, Lincoln saved to be read out by a voice other than his own that of the special messenger for the president in Congress in his second annual message uh, on December 1st, 1862. 70 days after the preliminary Emancipation Proclamation was issued, 30 days before its rejection by the seceded states would assure the passing of emancipation into law. And here are those words. And they're some of the greatest Lincoln ever wrote, for sure. And it, it is uh, interesting, I think, that he uh, wrote these for an occasion where he knew he would not be speaking them. The occasion is piled high with difficulty, and we must rise with the occasion. As our case is new, so we must think anew and act anew. We must disenthrall ourselves, and then we shall save our country. Fellow citizens, we cannot escape history. We of this Congress and this administration will be remembered in spite of ourselves. No personal significance or insignificance can spare one or another of us. The fiery trial through which we pass will light us down in honor or dishonor to the latest generation. We say we are for the Union. The world will not forget that we say this. We know how to save the Union. The world knows we do know how to save it. We, even we here, hold the power and bear the responsibility. In giving freedom to the slave, we assure freedom to the free, honorable alike in what we give and what we preserve. We shall nobly save or meanly lose the last best hope of earth. Other means may succeed. This could not fail. A trace of tactical uh, disguise may still be present here. The occasion is war and we must detach ourselves from habits of moderate action that are appropriate in times of peace. But the unusual word disenthrall, as Lincoln employs it, has several converging senses. Never, indeed, has a single word carried more weight, at once metaphorical and literal, psychological and moral. Actual chains are being broken, and their removal will soon be a matter of law. Illusions of mastery and inborn privilege, the mental correlative of those chains, must now also be shed. One notices, too, in these words, the concern with the relationship between what we hear ourselves say and mean and what we end up doing. That, that was a preoccupation of Lincoln's, and it helps explain the significance to him 
of the words of the proclamation, not only the legal language Richard Hofstetter affected to deplore as possessing no more charm than, quote, a bill of lading. I don't know how much more charm a law is supposed to have than a bill of lading. But the binding language, which was, of course, legal, but something more. I have in mind the words, quote, then, thenceforward, and forever free. Lincoln said about his signing of the proclamation, I never in my life felt more certain that I was doing right than I do in signing this paper. How did Lincoln manage to square the radicalism of emancipation with his constant appeal to the different sounding aim of merely acting to preserve the Union? The two were, I believe, connected in his mind by a definition of union, that artificial, geographical, and political entity, with a moral principle centered on unity and integrity. The nation rules itself for the same reason that one person rules over one. No more than one can govern one, and one cannot govern more than one. To think otherwise would be to misunderstand the meaning of union. It's why he ins so insists uh, on the uh, idea that the Union preceded the states. Uh, it's just because a misunderstanding has been allowed to prevail that the nation now requires a new birth of freedom. The special sense of Union was not hidden or esoteric, but neither was it articulated by any clear paraphrase or spelled out in a coherent uh, digest in one place. The closest Lincoln came was a passage of his special message to Congress of July 4, uh, 1862. Again, interestingly, a speech read out by a messenger and not by himself. He said there that the aim of the Union was, quote, to elevate the condition of men, to, to lift artificial weights from all shoulders, to clear the paths of laudable pursuit for all, to afford all an unfettered start and a fair chance in the race of life. And again, here, as with the complex use of disenthrall, one can't help remarking how slavery is implicated in the words. The artificial weights are literal weights for some, and the fetters, unfettered start, the fetters have been shackles. It's the repetition of the word all, three times in four clauses, that shows already how far the idea of emancipation, whether swift or gradual, uh, was present to Lincoln's understanding of the meaning of union. That's July 4th, 1861. Many local details were included in the order of emancipation on January 1, 1863, and it's natural for moderate-minded readers now to be eager to detect in these a symptom of evasion and further compromise. Why were the border states allowed to keep their slaves? What could be the meaning of emancipating slaves only in those parts of the Union that the Union Army had not yet reached to enforce the order? But that wasn't how Frederick Douglass read the occasion. Quoting again from Douglass's speech to the Freeman's Monument, 1876. Can any colored man or any white man friendly to the freedom of all men ever forget the night which followed the first day of January, 1863, when the world was to see if Abraham Lincoln would prove to be as good as his word? I shall never forget that memorable night when in a distant city I waited and watched at a public meeting with 3,000 others not less anxious than myself for the word of deliverance. Nor shall I ever forget the outburst of joy and thanksgiving that rent the air when the lightning brought to us the Emancipation Proclamation. In that happy hour, we forgot all delay and forgot all tardiness. And of course, the Union Army was continuing southward, liberating as it went, and slaves themselves were not minutely attentive to the legal language of exceptions in the document, uh, nor were they indifferent to the word of deliverance itself. Often they emancipated themselves ahead of the army and walked to their freedom behind Union lines. In fact, the proclamation necessarily went beyond its own letter and in one stroke illegitimated slavery forever. And in doing so, it bore out the expectation of the House Divided speech. <clears throat> the Union, uh, in order to avoid the fate of becoming all slave and enthralling itself to the idea as well as the practice of despotism, must become all free. 
Let me, in closing, uh, return to Lincoln's own renunciation of credit or responsibility for the radical course of action he chose to pursue and enforce. He wrote in his letter to Albert G. Hodges, April 4, 1864, quote, what I got to before, I claim not to have controlled events, but plainly confess that events have controlled me. Foner lists among the contributing causes or events that influenced him to issue the proclamation these. The actual need for more soldiers of any race to fight the war, the conti- what Lincoln himself called military necessity, the continuing refusal by the border states to consent to Lincoln's plan of gradual emancipation, the continuing pressure by congressional radicals for such a proclamation, actions by the slaves who ignored the authority of masters and freed themselves, and finally the decision lately acknowledged by Lincoln to wage war against the society of the South and not only against its armed forces. But when Lincoln claimed not to have controlled events and confessed uh, that uh, they had controlled him, we ought perhaps to shift our usual focus from the word control and turn instead to the words claim and confess. Lincoln was here admitting a sense of impotence at not having introduced emancipation sooner, and he was refusing to claim the responsibility for an action whose timing had to so large an extent been determined by events. It's timing determined by events. But the responsibility was his, the responsibility of a leader for a decisive act, and it was far from his intention to deny that. In the second inaugural, he would speak of American slavery, first time he used that phrase, American slavery, as a stain on American democracy, a dark collective crime for which the only expiation might have been collective sacrifice. The commitment that led uh, him to say uh, just that is legible in the action that remains singular in the annals of non-miraculous history. Thank you. So we have um, some time for questions, and then we'll have a reception after that. But we do have the floors open to some questions. As always, it's wonderful to hear you, David. Um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, well, at least you heard that first part. I did. Um, at the beginning, I think you said the two great motives were hatred of violence and love of liberty. Jonathan quoted that oh, from something, I know. From something but else. Something you wrote. Yeah, I did say it, yeah. Okay. You, you wrote it, you didn't say it. Now, I was just, I was, would like to hear more about violence. I think the only time it appeared in these remarks were about the Kansas-Nebraska Act. In the letter to speed. Past and yeah. uh, this, uh, where violence there takes the uh, rather I'll say unburkean notion of doing things in disregard of what your constituents want. Well, I think what, he's, what eight, is violence? Eighteen fifty-five. He is already thinking. I mean, John Brown hadn't yet struck in Kansas, but he is already thinking of the conflicts he sees going on because of the Nebraska Act, because of the different people moving in and being at each other's throats. Um, but he is talking about, the, you're, you're, you're right, he's talking about the violence as he sees it, the violence to democracy of secret deals being made in order to perpetuate a bad understanding. And so there is a, there is a loose metaphorical application of it as well as a sort of creeping physical um, reference that he thinks uh, Speed will know about. They both know the experience of the border states when this sort of clash, I think, was more usual. But what I, uh, what I meant in that other essay written uh, some years ago by saying that uh, hatred of violence was part of Lincoln's ethic as well as love of liberty was that, uh, you know, the, the uh, condemnation of mob action, of, of what he calls the mob spirit and mobocracy in the perpetuation speech of 1838 uh, is not, I think, only about um, 
uh, the danger to the civil order of, of people using their fists or using guns or engaging in lynchings. Uh, it's also about the, the um, uh, it's also about the gradual habituation of people to manners of solving things quickly like that or taking pleasure in revenge instead of justice. Revenge which Francis Bacon calls a kind of wild justice. But Lincoln didn't want that, didn't care for it. And the whole burden, in a way, uh, mm. as a piece of American history writing or you know, rewriting of the, the myth of American founding and after in the perpetuation speech of 1838 is to say, uh, the, look, the, the people who fought in the Revolutionary War had their glory. Um, but that kind of glory, the glory of war, is something we shouldn't any longer aspire to. Shouldn't aspire to it, period. And what Lincoln is um, suppressing from his own thinking when he supposes that democracy goes against the violence of the spirit as such, is slavery and is, 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 the, is the legal um, perpetuation of slavery and the slave system and the oppression it brings and suppressing slave revolts when they happen and so on, is that somehow not violence? Can you say that's not violence if you believe that the, that the Negro is a man? Since it is violence, um, you know, Lincoln can claim that's the, that's, the, that's the origin of what we have to fight. Uh, and yeah, he goes against his, his um, uh, inward uh, horror at violence by uh, uh, fighting the Civil War. No doubt about that. I, and I did not mean to present Lincoln as obviously it would be absurd as an unconditional opponent of violence. But I think that's the, that's the doctrine. Um, and I do think that explains the extent to which he put himself forward with formulations that could help to avert the war. Um, this idea of the public mind shall rest and that it is in the course of an ultimate extinction is, a, is an extraordinary idea because it depends on the existence of a leader who is able to discern, to interpret, you know, um, calculably and, and um, answerably the sentiments of the people. And that their sentiments are peaceful and going towards abolition, let's let it go. And Lincoln's, in this respect, very Burkean design was to let it go, as you know, for another 37 years. I think that was his favored plan. He would have liked to get the border states and eventually to conquer and get the um, slave states without, without the complete war that it ended up requiring to agree to give up slavery in the year 1900 and to pay compensated emancipation to them along the way. And he says in one place of reasoning about this, if you do this, you avoid the extraordinary bloodletting of a war, though the, the extent of it surprised him as it surprised everyone in the Civil War. But he said also, you, you've made a promise which is intelligible. Every a slave, black woman slave, say, who is a grandmother and who has that oppression and hopelessness in her life will know that her grandchild is going to be free. And that's something, that connection to a promise which will be kept. Um, that, you know, it's a plan that's not much talked about, but I think it was more in Lincoln's mind than is talked about. And that was his, so to speak, nonviolent resolution of the slavery problem, except that it was sophistical. It forgot the violence of slavery itself. And it's in that sense that I do think he's rebuking himself in the second inaugural, when he says we've never really admitted that this is something we could call American slavery. Allison. <clears throat> I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about the Constitution specifically. So it seems like one could distinguish between Lincoln's views on laws and his views on the Constitution, especially in the Emancipation Proclamation and the choice of using executive authority versus a constitutional amendment or a statute, um, since there was discussion of all of those things. So what his take was about the Constitution specifically as a source of law? The, that story is told pretty well in the Spielberg movie uh, with the Kushner uh, screenplay, which is itself taken from a good book on the 14th Amendment by a professor at Brown, whose name I forget. Michael Vorenberg. Yeah. Yeah. My, say, it, say it again. Michael Vorenberg. Michael Vorenberg. Yeah, Thank you. Terrific. And He deserves credit, deserved it uh, on the final credits of the film, so let's give it to him now. Um, what happened in... Lincoln, as the movie correctly construes it, 
um, knew that the Emancipation Proclamation was, was a military command by the commander-in-chief in time of war. But he wanted to bring, he wanted to bring the law-abidingness that he praised so much back into the scheme of things even during the war and so asked for the 13th Amendment, uh, should I say 14th, 13th Amendment uh, to be passed, abolishing slavery, to be passed by Congress, and he got it. Um, and uh, the story of how it happened, which is basically the plot of the movie, is told not in Doris Kearns Goodwin's book, Team of Rivals, which is the book they contracted to make into a movie, but in Vorenberg's book. Um, I won't even say what I think about that, but I do think scholars, even if they're assistant professors who've inspired a movie that makes billions of dollars, ought to get a bit more credit. So I mean, I think that's I think that's what Lin what Lincoln's view was. Now, he he did um, suspend elements of constitutional practice that, by his own lights, uh, he should never have wanted to uh, dodge for a single moment when he was commander in chief in the Civil War, and and there. I suppose if you are Lincoln, your only uh, rash, uh, rationale is to say, I, I'm, I'm performing a greater evil, a, a lesser evil in order to avoid a greater evil. But I don't think any other way of um, reasoning about it is open to him. Um, now, the larger question or the related um, way of thinking um, that you can get from his writings is that the, the, the Constitution is, of course, just a framework of laws. Um, Lincoln thinks he can read the spirit of the laws in the Declaration of Independence. And he has a, I think it's just a fragment somewhere, one of those paragraphs like his, anti, his, his entry on uh, government, his entry on pro-slavery theology, as he called it, where he says the relation between the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence should somehow be that of a of golden alp apples inside a silver frame. I think that's it. But the frame is the Constitution, and the real, the, the, the priceless gift is the Declaration of Independence. Now, people were already worshipful toward the Declaration of Independence in these years, but uh, uh, <laughs> not as much as Lincoln was. It's, it's, it's he, more than anybody else of that period, who has made us regard the Declaration as quite so important. And um, <laughs> you know, he's very funny on this subject too. When when people say things like "there's no there's no reason to suppose that by all men are created equal," uh, Jefferson and the other signers really meant all men. Lincoln says, "Oh, they didn't. Well, why should why should why should we not think that perhaps they didn't even mean men? They meant something else." I mean, he he is he takes advantage of the. Um, uh, what to say of common sense in that um, uh, set of arguments, and he and he put he pushes it as far as he can. Um, were there specific enactment, uh, specific provisions of the Constitution you had in mind besides, say, um, the the fact that he's he's making a new law as Commander in Chief, or besides the suspension of habeas corpus, which would be another obvious place? Well, were I guess others? I was thinking about the connection between the Lyceum speech and the civic civil religion idea, and then the discussions about containment amendments, say, in 1860, containing slavery via constitutional amendment. Yeah. So. No, it's the way he would have liked to do it. But uh, the, the Southern spirit was much more, um, what to say, uh, warlike and domineering than Lincoln, than Lincoln could afford to admit when he was running for president, and perhaps more than he wanted to admit to himself in his first weeks at president, uh, as president, there, are, there is a, a period, not too long a period, but a period of willful self-delusion about secession and how it, it needn't mean um, what it seems to mean. But pretty quickly he snaps back and um, gives you formulations like that one from July 4th, 1861, which I quoted. Um, thank you for your enlightening and poetic um, remarks. Um, I don't want it to be oh, poetic. Well, well um, I'm wondering if you could parse. Is this not right? I'm, not working. I'm wondering if you could parse this sentence, which I'm paraphrasing, but it's a refrain, and it goes something like this: "Just because I don't want her for a slave, doesn't mean I want her for a wife. I just want to let her." Alone. I can just let her alone, or he can just let her alone. Yeah, well, that's when Douglas, there's an insinuation by Douglas that Lincoln, that, uh, Lincoln is moving towards miscegenation by, uh, 
in, inculcating a tolerance for mixing of black and white races. Lincoln's actually very careful on that point, and he, he is careful to say, it's, it's, it's a curious piece of phraseology too, he'll, he'll never say, this is my view, he'll say, it's, it's, it's on the whole how I feel, but even if it weren't, I can't go against a general sentiment that they are not our intellectual, uh, social, or political equals. Or that he has a note uh, uh, in that pro-slavery theology fragment. He actually says, suppose it is true that they're not our equals. Funny that he would write that in a note to himself. I mean, I, I, don't, I really think Lincoln was uncertain about this idea of innate equality or inequality. But what he's getting at with Douglas there, it, it's, you're right to quote it, it's a very interesting and characteristic uh, response of his, and he does repeat it two or three times. I don't have to have her as my mistress uh, or my slave, I can just leave her alone. Um, I think Lincoln wanted people to leave each other alone quite a lot more than we do. <laughs> Um, and I, 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 I'm not trying to dodge the question uh, or any implication about Lincoln's racial views uh, that might be lurking there. Um, he certainly extricates himself from the accusation by Douglas by saying it that way. But I think he, I think one of the things he finds ignoble about slaveholding is that you're, you're, you're you're doing things, you, he's very insistent on the side that you know the Negro is a man because you treat him as a different kind of property. It shows in all sorts of ways, the tenderness of some slaveholders towards their slaves, lots of other things. And there's something, uh, there's something ugly and unseemly and sticky and crude about the thing in human nature that comes out with these people wanting to pinch and say, I'll pay so much for her, uh, or wanting to exploit their slaves physically um, by having you know, an illegitimate child by them or whatever else. Actually, I think Lincoln finds that, that people jostling up against each other illicitly, imposing themselves physically on each other, I think he finds that disgusting. He was, to, I mean, though, though he was a man of the people and a very effective cracker barrel discourser, and it's said, this, this aspect of him is brought out beautifully in the John Ford movie. Um, you know, he enters a room, especially a room full of men, and he's very easily the center of humor and, and attention within a few minutes. So he has that kind of popular touch. But at the same time, he is very, he's a very lonely figure. Um, and this, you know, this is, this is a part of an older characteristic sense of, um, Lincoln uh, as, you know, manic, depressive, as suicidal, and so on, which has truth in it, too. Um, I think he was, to a very high degree, misanthropic. And um, he hated some people more than others. Um, and, 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 the, and the person who wants to do that to the slave woman is one of the kinds he really hates. I want to ask about your use of the word um, revolutionist, uh, in, particularly in the context of the, oh, thanks, the 1850s. Because so much of what you've uh, used, uh, the quotes that you've used, like, you know, talking about, has been, um, uh, it's been so defensive, as in, you know, talking about the Declaration of Independence and talking about a political order that's being subverted by a slave power conspiracy and trying to preserve the order that exists uh, from this slave power threat. Um, so I was wondering, is this, is this sort of, do you see this as kind of a, um, as a sales pitch to get people on board with what is, in fact, a revolutionary agenda, and something not simply of restoring what the founders themselves have done, which in his mind is, in fact, putting slavery on the road to ultimate extinction, but that this, this sort of slave power, I mean, as you said with the, uh, the Declaration of Independence and saying that all men are great equal, he says in the context of that, he says, I've only, it's only recently that people deny that this didn't apply to all men. I, I never heard that until Stephen Douglas and these other people, and now they're beginning to say it, so... I'm curious whether he was, in your opinion, a revolutionist in the 1850s or... Um... Well, uh, yeah, my, my title is too provocative for my contents, he is saying, <laughs> even, even though some of the content is there. Um, it, it, it's mostly uh, the centrality of the house divided speech on which I would hang the uh, inference that Lincoln is a revolutionist at heart in those years. Um, especially from 1858 on, and it comes out in more in, in two speeches given in Chicago in the Edwardsville speech. It comes out a little bit earlier in the Kalamazoo speech, and 
It's there, it's there in the three or four places on, on this campaign of persuasion that becomes a nationwide campaign by him, where he'll conclude, um, he'll, con he'll conclude with a, a phrase like, uh, stick to your guns. But they're not quite innocent phrases uh, anymore. There's something, something akin to that, even we rallied around and we're, we're now together as a group, it's like an army, a small army, at the end of the House Divided speech. Um, I, the, his word is retrogression. He believed, he, he, he persuaded himself, um, even after the Mexican War, which he saw as a terrible premonition of the extension of slavery, it was creating new appetites. Uh, he persuaded himself that the, the compromise over Missouri and, you know, perhaps as later historians sometimes assume would have been the case, um, perhaps slavery would just die out by its own economic incapacity and so on. He may, he may have used these what he calls lullaby arguments on himself. But, uh, but uh, he, he firmly believed in the influence of people's ways of saying things and what the jokes they were willing to laugh at, the things they were willing to tolerate. He, he connected that, which he calls sentiments, usually, um, he connected that with the whole morale of a people and what, what would become their politics and the kinds of oppression or freedom that they were uh, ready to consider normal. And I think when he, when, he, when he hears more and more people talking about the rights of slaveholders um, and, and the, the slave South itself insisting that you don't call us illegitimate, don't refer to us as practicing a form of domination that's alien to American freedom, that comes up in the Cooper Union speech very much. They, they want us to stop saying it. They want us to stop even saying that slavery is wrong. And Lincoln um, urges his audience to say it to yourselves and keep on saying it. it is wrong and then act like what you're saying. So um, I think he observes a retrogression. I think that the observation is there in 1854 and I think to actually bite the bullet you've just given me, um, I think the Dred Scott decision is what does it, and it comes out in certain powerful moments of the speech on the Dred Scott decision. I think what he really felt in some, some real part of himself was, there's, we can't wait for another such decision, the decision that will legitimate slavery in the states too. Because Tawney's opinion had, left, had not left that opening, it had made that clear that if it ever came to the Supreme Court, they were gonna say you couldn't, shut, you couldn't exclude slavery from the states. Um, and at that point, Lincoln felt it could be nationalized. And um, uh, at that point, he was, uh, at heart, a revolutionist. There is a... One second. Please come to a reception outside, and now let us thank David.